A fursona is a combination of the word furry and persona, as you would expect. It's sort of an alter ego, usually assumed by someone within the furry fandom. It's estimated that 95% of the furry community have at least one fursona, with wolves and foxes being amongst the most popular types of fursonas. Once someone has their fursona in mind, they will commission an artist they'd like to draw their character for around $100 to $300 although prices vary from artist to artist. The end result will usually look something like this. The character is being shown off in a 360 view with the name and colors associated off to the side. While I lack the necessary skill and practice required to turn my artistic talents into profit, there are plenty of other people who can. But it's important to know what kind of artists you're supporting financially as they could have done some very horrible and terrible things in the past. What makes these artists special though is that their actions are very much known about within their community, yet they still remain. Zosh or Adam Wan is a not safe for work furry artist specializing in duck holding and cub. Don't worry if you don't know what cub is, I'll explain it later. He has been pumping out this content for quite a while now. While I'm not necessarily sure when he started posting his drawings, his DeviantArt page is as old as me. So it's possible that he has been on the grind for almost two decades now. By 2013, he must have been big enough to get the attention of the at the time fur affinity owner Dragoneer, who made him the leader of a group of volunteer programmers with the purpose of rewriting the fur affinity code dubbed Project Phoenix. Although to say Adam was underqualified for this task would be an understatement, and this poor choice of leadership would eventually lead to the failure of Project Phoenix with it never rising up ever again. While the project was a failure, it did manage to bring to light onto some accusations that were made against Adam by an ex-girlfriend of his named Ferality, who said that Zosh had emotionally manipulated her and intimidated her into sexual acts. So trigger warning for the following story. The story goes that Adam and his now ex fiance Kiovi had met Ferality at Califer in 2009 after talking with each other over AIM for some time. While meeting the two, they would explain that they had an open relationship because Adam had an interest in having relations with her. Morality would decline his offer because she had a boyfriend. Her next real life encounter with the couple happened after Ferality broke up with her boyfriend and visited their residence in order to look at the art college Kiovi was attending. While at their place, Adam would constantly pressure her into having relations with the couple even though she had explained she wasn't interested in that before arriving. She would relent after dealing with the constant pressure and allowed Adam to massage her while topless. This would lead to Adam getting on top of her and undressing her further which caused Ferality to freeze up and not speak up about her extreme discomfort. The day ended with Adam and Kiyovi getting intimate while Ferality just stood there and watched them. She would leave their house the next day. She would stop speaking with Adam for a while after this, but eventually would resume contact with him near the end of the year, where Adam would continue to ask her to visit again as it wasn't fair that Kiyovi was able to sleep around with, with more people than him, and because of that, she owed him for it. Ferality would continue to decline his offers and eventually Adam would call Ferality at least twice expressing his anger towards her for not wanting to have relations with him as he only has her best interest in mind and that he could help her with her issues. The pleading for Ferality to visit again would intensify after Kyovi went to China to spend New Year's with her father and Adam was left alone at their house and so Ferality would once again visit Adam. Shortly after her arrival, Adam would call Kiovi and ask if he had permission to have relations with Ferality as she stood right in front of him, which in her mind was to further manipulate her. While talking to Adam, he would bring up the fact that another woman had accused him in the past of giving her alcohol so that he could get his way with her. So as a precaution, they wouldn't be drinking until after they had relations. How comforting. After spending the weekend with Adam, she would leave in order to go to work, but while leaving, Adam would insist that she instead quit her job and stay with him because he was so lonely. She would refuse and leave. And that's all she wrote to Dragoneer. 
I'm assuming that this was the last time she spoke with Adam as she didn't explain what happened after. I think it's very important to mention Ferraldi was unable to provide any evidence to back up her claims. Writing to Dragoneer, I had been talking with him via AIM. Sadly, I do not have any logs and personal cell phone text slash calls. It's actually why she contacted Dragoneer in the first place to see if it was a good idea to post her story on Fur Affinity and Dragoneer would actually make a pretty reasonable response to this. I can't tell you what action to take, but I can tell you that if you do go against Sash, you will have to risk backlash and reputation damage by his fans, right or wrong. I've seen enough drama on Fur Affinity to last a lifetime. It's important to note that in a case like this, the other woman will need to speak up as well. Otherwise, you stand to risk having everything fall back on you. If you have backing and they'll stand up and speak out with you, it may be worth doing so. If you feel that you may end up standing alone, it may hurt you and your art and result in more stress than not. I won't say anything about the issue. It's not my place to. If it's something serious, it should be brought up. But you also have to weigh in the process and the cons of doing so. You need to sit down and consider how it could benefit you and how it could get the word out, but also how it can be turned around and used against you. It's not cut and dry grape, like you said with the Bill Cosby method, which seems to be the only form of grape taken seriously in modern American culture. Later on, either after or before the conversation between Dragoneer and Ferality would leak, other women, the youngest being 18 while Adam was 27, claimed to have had similar experiences with Adam, these being Little Blue Wolf, Shinigami Girl, Wolf Nymph, and Rainbow Joker Hound. Although, once again, no evidence was provided, so nothing would ever come from any of these accusations. After the leak occurred, Adam would make a response to it, giving more context to his interactions with Ferality and explain his side of the story while providing some actual chat messages between them. However, I think these messages aren't available to view anymore as the link to the screenshots have been removed in order to comply with the new Fur Affinity rules. What can actually be read is Adam basically explaining that he's not a you-know-what, and that her whole view of the interactions changed drastically once she got back with her ex-boyfriend, which resulted in the drama that followed. While he may have dodged a major bullet, Adam would embarrass himself later on after a man named Cinnamon stole his fiancée, to which he drew all work of himself being cut. I guess to commemorate Cinnamon's achievement? I don't really know, this guy is pretty weird as you'll find out. The next major incident that would happen to Adam revolves around cub art. Cub art, for those who don't know, is basically furry lolly. Not safe for drawings of underage animals, to be specific. Hence the name, Cub. While this type of art is taboo within the furry fandom, there are still a lot of people who consume this very concerning content and financially support any artist who can supply them with it. One of these consumers slash producers is Adam. In 2018, his then girlfriend managed to take pictures of Adam's iPad and post the findings anonymously. It was discovered that Adam was commissioning cub art from the sick individual known as Cobalt Dog. In their conversations, Adam would share images of children in bathing suits and actual cod points so that Cobalt can use them as references. With other discoveries like how Adam would go from someone as low as 10 years old, you would think it was all fake. Although Adam would later come out and say that the pictures were real. But the stuff that people thought was COD points was actually just adult actors pretending to be children. Like that makes him look any better. This also doesn't excuse the fact that he sent actual pictures of children in bathing suits as a reference for his not safe for work commission. You would think that this would be the end for Adam, but that is not the case. As of now, Adam is still active and profiting from the furry community with his artwork. While his fur affinity has been banned, his Twitter and subscribe star are still up and running. Now, the thing is, most reasonable people would immediately distance themselves from a person like Adam once they hear about his actions. But I don't think his supporters are very reasonable and are actually more like Adam than you would suspect. Remember, Adam makes his own cub content, and it's very well known that he does. So of course, anyone who likes that kind of stuff will be more than happy to support Adam, and anyone who doesn't will not. Let's just hope that Adam and his fans stick to just drawings of underage characters instead of acting upon their desires in real life. Jason FX, Jason FX, I don't really know how you say this guy's name. I'm just gonna call him Jason from now on. 
is a very infamous, not safe for work furry artist. He would actually start off his career back in 2012, not in the furry fandom, but in the Team Fortress 2 community, where he did the exact same stuff he does now, drawing NSFW. Although, instead of it being a furry, it was the character Pyro. Even at this time, he would run into some issues, but they weren't really too damning. What would really impact his future was also in 2012, when he will meet his now wife, Kabir. At this time, the two weren't dating, and she was instead with a German man named Aaron. Kabir and Aaron would be the ones to discover Jason, and would then commission him to make NSFW animations featuring their two personas, which included them voice acting their own characters. The major problem with this is that Kabir was 16 at the time, while Jason was 21 and Aaron 19. To make things worse, that same year Kabir and Aaron would break up for whatever reason, no one really cares. But not too long after the breakup, Jason would begin dating Kabir himself and would continue to post more NSFW art of him and Kabir. This probably does break some kind of law or at least rule on the website, as content featuring minors wouldn't be allowed. Jason and Kabir would eventually come to their senses and would try to delete everything they can from this time period because it makes Jason look incredibly bad. Thankfully though, the really damning stuff has been archived, although I wonder what other things managed to slip away. Oh wow, I've never been to one of these clubs before. <laughs> Amoris is a game that was created by Jason and Kabir, but obviously these two couldn't create a game on their own so they hired some other people to help them out. Although the people that were hired had a terrible experience working on the project as they were not treated or compensated very well for their time. With one employee making around $2.31 an hour, the shenanigans didn't end there as this game also needed to be funded. And while Jason and Kabir were lowballing their employees, they still couldn't pay for all the expenses on their own, so a Patreon was created for those who wanted to support the game. One of these tiers was $750, and its main selling point was that you could be featured in the game as a background character. Now, I'm not too familiar with game development, but is that not overpriced as hell for just being a background character? I mean, we all know what kind of game Jason is making here. I better get at least a few cutscenes featuring my character if I'm paying you $750, that's all I'm saying. Anyways, Jason would make an announcement saying that anyone who had purchased this tier would have to contact him or else they would sell this tier off to someone else. This is after already failing to meet the expectations of their backers in the past and I did not see any mention of a refund to those who missed the deadline. Jason would eventually move from Australia to Canada in order to live with Kabir. Their new living situation was very bad. At worst, it looks straight up inhospitable, and at best, it looks like a place where a serial killer will take his victims. The two were in a very dire situation too, having to deal with the poor living conditions, Gabriel's insane family possibly kicking them out at any time, and not having any proper heating while the Canadian winter was fast approaching. The two adults had no other option but to go online and beg for money asking for $3,000 in order to get some better heating and internet. Once they receive the money, you probably heard that they spent it on a Shiba Inu, a very cute dog with a heavy price. This comes from them sharing a picture of the dog in 2015, although the exact date of the post is unknown. According to Jason though, 3K was spent immediately on finishing our shower, installing the furnace, and renovating our wardrobe. It doesn't go very far. We paid for those renovations over three months ago. Selling in means we have accumulated plenty of savings since, meaning we could buy things. It could be possible that this dog was purchased towards the end of December, making Jason's post about the purchase believable. On the other hand though, this could have possibly been posted in November, making Jason a liar, his least offensive trait. It's up to you to decide what he really spent the money on. Although given that he denied the winner of a paid raffle because his request wasn't NSFW related, I wouldn't be too surprised if he did spend the money on a Shiba Inu. The most recent and most entertaining thing related to Jason would be the drama that he participated in with Peace Wolf and her now ex-husband Foxglove. I'm sure some of you have seen this tweet before as it got pretty popular when it came out especially because some of the images related to it. If you actually take the time out to read the story, it gets pretty entertaining towards the end, but it is a pretty long read. So I'll read you just enough 
To get a grip on her side of the story, I found myself in my very first online relationship at the age of 17. I had no identity to call my own and I did not feel fulfilled in regards to the love and attention I was getting from my parents growing up. I rushed into a relationship with the first person to give me attention I craved. After three years of mostly online dating, I married in 2017 at the age of 21. I learned that Fox had a mold for the perfect wife planned out before we met and did everything in his power to groom me into it. He had a fictional relationship of an illustrated woman named Lily, who was always pregnant, birthing children for him, does not work, is subordinate and unquestioning. Lily became my pet name and deviations from the fiction were quickly scolded. I realized that I was not loved for who I was, but was conditional based on the role I could play in a fantasy. There were whispers from concerned friends and family over the years, people telling me that Fox was not good for me. I was too naive to ever listen, and deny that they just didn't understand and that they were judging Fox unfairly. But the truth is, they saw him for who he really was, a narcissist preying on the inexperience of a sheltered girl. Three days before Free For All, July 2022, I received multiple leaked screenshots anonymously from concerned staff that Fox was fooling around and planned to have Vex with another female member of staff who was one of my close friends and also happened to be our roommate that year. I briefly asked Fox if he was doing anything I should know about with another woman and he said no. Not knowing I had been sent the receipts, I then showed him the evidence and only at that point did he confess to what he had done. I requested that he not be in the hotel room alone with this woman at any point during the convention, to which he promised he wouldn't. I ended up catching them in a room together by themselves at least once during the convention. This was not the first time Fox had done things of a sexual nature with other people. He told me it was my fault for not satisfying his sexual needs. I tried to participate in his sexual role plays of pregnant Lily, but the fact that he could not do so successfully in real life led him to resent me. Our Vex life ultimately resulted on, okay, how do I phrase this? Mm. <clears throat> Let's just say Fox was the one taking back shots once a month in order to help him disassociate. The woman he decided to cheat with was married and had children of her own, satisfying his fetishes more than I could. What do the children have to do with the fetish, man? I don't like how this sounds. I didn't tell a single soul about what was going on and tried to put on a front of stability all the while crumbling on the inside. Only a couple of attendees had their relationship experiences to see I was in serious pain, primarily Jason and Kabir. I really needed friends I could trust to talk to, so I invited them to stay in town one more day before they drove home, where I confided all this news to them. J and K encouraged me to take a weekend away from my hostile home environment and visit them in Canada. I learned quickly how broken my marriage really was gained to spend time with genuine friends that offered the support structure I was missing in my life. Despite my efforts, my relationship with Fox continued to deteriorate over the next few months. Both Fox and I invited J and K to visit our home for 10 days, with plans to experiment near the end of the visit with Fox's full knowledge, consent, and encouragement <sighs> as a couple that would not participate nor be invited to behind closed doors. Fox helped prepare their arrival by drawing their personas on the guest whiteboard, partially nude, and flirting with one another. The idea of him being a cuckold was exciting to him. Everything went as planned without drama or hostility, everyone seemingly having a great time. However, Fox grew jealous of the attention I was receiving and started showing his true colors in the second week, as his efforts to flirt with Kabir were rejected. This included referring to her as Miss Kate and rushing to open doors with a milady. Yeah, I'm not surprised this guy's a Fox then began to do everything in his power to get attention, even negative attention. He alternated between extremes of crying on the floor in the master bedroom closet curled up in the fetal position while holding a plushy version of Vengeance that Jason gifted me. By the way, Vengeance is Jason's persona name. To baking cookies and delivering them to the guest room while myself, Jason, and Kate were engaging intimately with each other. Fox never had a strong father figure as his father was in prison during his upbringing for voyeurism towards minors. For those who don't know, voyeurism is a practice of gaining sexual pleasure from watching others when they are naked or engaged in sexual activity. So yeah, it's a good thing this guy's in jail. Fox legally changed his identity to his persona name and moved states to further disassociate from his family's criminal history. I no longer wanted to be married to Fox. 
and requested space from him in the last couple of days of their visit so I could start planning on how to tell him that I wanted a divorce. Fox was having a meltdown over his whiteboard drawing being erased and replaced with one made by Cavs and that I had begun to pack my things. He had been rapidly sending text messages to my friends and family that I was running away, being drugged and sex trafficked, that he was suicidal and was in serious danger of hurting himself and others. He then stole Kabir's belongings that were left in our house and put them in the back of a rental car and drove to my friend's home with his gun, parking the rental car behind J and K to box them in. Fox had spun such a narrative of hysteria in one night that my friends broke into my home to check on him, had the police summoned my parents and many others all at once late into the night for a grand conspiracy to steamroll any attempt to take off my ring. It didn't work however, as I still told him I wanted a divorce despite all the theatrics. Fox would send a plethora of letters and phone calls that gradually transitioned from denial to threats, all of which I kept for safekeeping. Some of these threats detailed how he would never stop, would pursue me until death, and that if I leave, I would pay dearly, and he would ensure suffering would come my way. Fox would spend the majority of his spare time conspiring and obsessing over my life, taking over my peaceful fan discord, hacking into my Twitch account during live streams, harassing my friends, and turning the convention domain into ransomware among other attacks at my reputation. This escalated to hopping the security fence at my apartment complex and stealing my car on my birthday, going as far as to break the wheel lock I had left on it despite already having a vehicle of his own. Fox did not appear in court, settled digitally, and did not sit in the same room for mediation. He tried to offer nothing and that he would take everything from me, but I trusted my support network. That offer quickly caved in in the presence of my lawyers and he settled for almost all of my requests. I won the car, all my requested belongings, my share of the value of the home and compensation for damages for stealing my property. He won the Nintendo Switch. Honestly, Fox seems like the type of guy to consider that a win. J and K, they have loved me with more intent and sincerity than anyone I have ever known in my entire life. I feel that I can truly be myself around them, the real me. They saved my life as I wasn't really living. I made a decision to spend my life going forward by their side. For as long as they will have me, my best friends. As of speaking, Fox had been spending his time post-divorce, role-playing with himself, training AI, and uploading the results of his new Fox Club, Fox Club relationship development on social media. Having burned bridges with all our networked friends, Fox still refers to me by pet names like Hun to this day. Well, that was a pretty long read, but I hope you enjoyed it. Here are the pictures of Fox talking to an AI version of himself. Honestly, I wouldn't think this would be true, but he did also sell the whiteboard that, that was left by KBR, I think. Honestly, something's probably wrong with this guy. But yeah, this was a pretty crazy story. Jason and KBR ruined a, well, seemingly bad marriage. The phrase an open secret is very straightforwardly defined as a secret that isn't really hidden away. For example, Back in high school, I had a substitute teacher for my Spanish class and he allowed me to copy off my friend on her finals. Everyone in the class knew about it and even some people outside of my class knew about it. Yet, nothing happened to anyone involved. It was an open secret and I'm sure now that you have an idea of what that is, some of you have your own experiences with it. This is also a very fitting phrase for Jason effects, as his actions, especially the more heinous ones, have been known about at least since 2020, yet nothing has really happened to him. All his social medias are still up, his Patreon is still up, which is earning him over $4,000 every month, and his games are very much available to download. I believe there's one main reason for this. People don't support Jason for his personality. It's not a very good one anyways. There's a whole 55 minute long audio recording of Jason and Kabir berating and threatening another furry because he asked them to pay rent. Why do you hate why? We're because you're a liar. You're deceitful. You treat me like shit. You're trying to get my boyfriend to break up with me. No. You tried to touch that. me inappropriately. And now you're trying to make us pay rent. I had to tell you. You motherfucker. You live here for free. If I had that, any method, matter. if I had awful. any method to contact your father and tell him that you weren't going to school, I fucking would. Because you don't deserve to live here. So why do people support them? Looking at it from the outside, it seems they support him because of the type of content he creates. In my opinion, the supporters either don't know about their actions because they happened quite a while ago now and they're not really interacting with it for more than 10 minutes, or they just simply don't care 
and want him to push out more content so that they can continue to satisfy themselves. Whatever the case may be, I doubt things will change unless something new comes up that is as bad as his meeting with Kabir all those years ago. People like Jason, Adam, and really any other furry that I talked about on my channel are the reason why some people view the furry community in such a negative aspect. While they don't represent the entire community, it is clear like with any other fandom, furries have and will continue to have problems dealing with these kinds of people, especially if these problematic people are able to continue associating themselves with the fandom. If you made it this far into the video, then go ahead and subscribe to the channel and consider becoming a member to have your name in the intro. I have a few things I want to talk about unrelated to these people, so if you don't want to hear that, thank you for watching. I hope the audio quality wasn't too bad as I was figuring out this new mic and moving into my new place. So you probably noticed that I sound a little bit different every couple of segments. That's because I re-recorded this video like six or seven times and each time I did, I would just keep the old audio that didn't sound terrible. Hopefully it wasn't too distracting. I learned that my closet is a great place to record, although that does mean I have to come out the closet every time I'm done recording. Anyways, the intro song is called Rules of Engagement from Escape from Tarkov. I know a lot of people ask about the intro music on my videos, so you'll have an easier time finding it if you watch to the end. I'll see you guys next time when I talk about some creeps who really like ponies.